coming to you now is Bread of His Presence with your host, Pastor Cameron Urie, Senior Pastor and Bible Teacher at Renton Park Chapel in Renton, Washington. Well, greetings and welcome again to Bread of His Presence. So glad you could join us today for another study of the Word of God together. As you know, we've been in the story of Joseph for some time now, and it's hard to find a story, any story really, in the Bible that has more drama, more excitement than this story has. I mean, every single passage is just filled with it. And each section ends, like all good episodic stories do, with a cliffhanger. If ever you were going to cheat in your Bible reading plan by reading ahead, it would probably be this story. And what makes it even more remarkable is that it's a true story. All these things really happened to this young man, Joseph. Now, up until this point, his life has kind of been like a yo-yo, this constant up and down, roller coaster-like experience. He started off being the favored son of his father. But then, of course, he's cast down into the pit by his brothers who actually then go on to sell him into slavery. And he's carried off to Egypt, he's sold to a man by the name of Potiphar, and then his life kind of bounces back up as he's put in charge of the entire household. But then, of course, he's falsely accused of attempted rape by Potiphar's wife. And so his life plummets again this time into the royal prison. Now, while in prison, he finds favor in the eyes of the prison warden. And again, he's lifted up and he's put in charge over everything. But every section, this one included, as we'll see, ends with a downer, with Joseph being cast down in some way. And you're just waiting for him to be lifted up and stay lifted up. For God to break through the cycles of turmoil in his life. And that's part of what makes this story, I think, so relevant to you and to me. Because that is very similar to what you and I experience. Sometimes we ask God, God, when is all this ever going to end? Why do bad things keep happening to me over and over again? We want to experience that exaltation like the one Joseph will eventually experience when he's lifted up by Pharaoh and made grand vizier over all of Egypt, second in command. But what the story of Joseph teaches us is that the suffering is not only a part, it is the necessary part of the experience. Joseph didn't come to Egypt ready for the task that God had given him. In order to fulfill the role that God had for him in Egypt as the Grand Vizier, he had to first be trained in the house of Potiphar, and then later in the prison. He had to be prepared administratively but I think also spiritually. He had to grow in terms of his faith and trust in God. And it was in the down times that God was in fact doing his greatest work, that important dominoes were falling into place that were setting into motion the most important transitions in Joseph's life. And two of those dominoes we met last week. And they came in the persons of the Pharaoh's chief cupbearer and the chief baker, with whom Pharaoh had become angry and threw into prison. Potiphar, the captain of the guards, knew of no better person to put them under than Joseph. And so he entrusts them into his care. And of course, Joseph does as he always does, faithfully. Going beyond just feeding and providing for them, no, he also cares about their emotional health, which we see very powerfully expressed in our passage today. Go ahead and look with me, starting at verse 5. It says, The king of Egypt's cupbearer 
and Baker, who were confined in the prison, each had a dream. Both had a dream on the same night, and each dream had its own meaning. When Joseph came to them in the morning, he saw that they looked distraught. Now, Joseph sees that both of these men are just troubled. And you might think, well, yeah, they're in prison. Of course they're going to be troubled. But no, this was something else. This was something much deeper. They were beyond just normal, everyday prison sadness. No, they were distraught. And Joseph notices this. Now, note that he's in charge over them, and yet he is serving them. And I think, you know, that is such a beautiful picture. Because true leaders are true servants. I'm reminded of the sons of Zebedee and how their mother wanted them to sit on Jesus' right and left hand when he came into his kingdom. What does he do? It says, Jesus called them over and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them, and those in high positions act as tyrants over them. It must not be like that among you. On the contrary, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first among you must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. That is how Joseph was. And so it says in verse 7, So he asked Pharaoh's officers who were in custody with him in his master's house, Why do you look so sad today? Now, as we saw last week, this inquiring of Joseph as to why they are so upset, it gives us a window not only into Joseph's heart, but also into the heart of Jesus. Joseph is, in so many ways, a picture of who Jesus is and what Jesus has come to do in each and every one of our lives. And it begins with seeing the state that we are in and having compassion on us. We have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All of us have been in bondage to sin and death. But Jesus, like Joseph did, entered into our prison and compassionately sought to minister to us and serve us. Yet, of course, Jesus came to do so willingly. Now, it says in verse 8, We had dreams, they said to him, but there is no one to interpret them. Now, I don't know if you can remember the last time you had a dream that deeply disturbed you. Um, Sometimes stress in our day-to-day lives can bleed over into our sleep and give us nightmares. And when you wake up, we immediately see the plot holes in the dreams, don't we? (laughs) And uh, we realize just how ridiculous they often are. But don't they seem so real when you're having them? Have you ever woken up from a dream and when you realized it's a dream, you're just beside yourself with joy? that what happened in that dream didn't really come true? You have that huge sense of relief, and hopefully you're able to then fall asleep again. (laughs) Or if it's time to get up, move on and go about your day and not even really think about it anymore, not even remember it anymore. But you know, I find it interesting how whenever God sends a dream, it is never forgotten. It stays with a person in the most exquisite detail. There's no, wow, that was only a dream moment. No, the effect of the dream, the emotion that God meant for it to have, it lingers and it cannot be shaken. There is something unnatural, or perhaps I should say supernatural, about the dreams that God sends. And God sent these kinds of dreams to many people, in and throughout the Bible. God spoke to the pagan ruler Abimelech in a dream in Genesis 20. God spoke to Jacob in dreams in Genesis 28. He spoke to Laban in a dream in Genesis 31. He spoke to the Midianite in a dream in Judges 7. 
He spoke to Solomon in a dream in 1 Kings 3. He spoke to Nebuchadnezzar in a dream in Daniel chapter 2. And he spoke to Daniel in a dream in Daniel chapter 7. God spoke to Joseph, the husband of Mary, in dreams. And God spoke to Pilate's wife in a dream. And what's interesting is that God spoke more often through dreams when he was engaging with unbelievers or pagans than when he was engaging with his own people. In fact, almost twice as many times as he spoke to his people in dreams. And the same thing seems to be true today. You know, I'm not sure if you're aware of the phenomenon that's been sweeping across the Muslim world for decades now, But multitudes of Muslims are coming to faith in Jesus Christ. And many of them are doing so after having Jesus himself appear to them in visions and dreams. Now, the accounts vary somewhat, but they virtually all have the same characteristics. First, Jesus appears to them. Second, Jesus tells them, find and speak to a person at a certain place, at a certain time. And then third, when the Muslim follows Jesus' instructions, he or she finds the person at exactly the right time and place, and the person explains to them who Jesus is and presents the gospel. And the fourth thing that happens is that the Muslim believes that Jesus is the Messiah and places his or her faith in him, renouncing Islam. You know, I just read a story of a Persian migrant who arrived at a refugee center at 6 o'clock a.m. in the morning, visibly upset. He told his story to a Persian pastor. During the night, he saw someone dressed in white who raised his hand and said, stand up, follow me. And the Persian man said, Who are you? And the man in white replied, I am the Alpha and the Omega. I'm the way to heaven. No one can go to the Father except through me. And he began to ask the Persian pastor, Who is he? What am I going to do? Why did he ask me to follow him? How shall I go? Tell me. And in response, the pastor held out his Bible and asked, Have you seen this before? No, he replied. Do you know what it is? No. The pastor then opened to the book of Revelation and read, I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. And the man started crying and he said, How can I accept him? How can I follow him? And so the pastor led him in prayer, and peace washed over him. The pastor then gave the man a Bible, told him to hide it, since the Muslims in the camps could cause him trouble. But the man replied, you know, the Jesus that I met today, he's more powerful than the Muslims in the camp. And he left and one hour later, he returned with ten more Persians and told the pastor, these people want a Bible. No one had to tell him what evangelism was or what the best evangelistic strategy was. No, he had met Jesus, and so he couldn't help but go and tell. Now, the point is that God will use whatever means necessary to reach people who are seeking him or seeking answers that only he can bring. He is faithful to send a message, and even more so, a messenger. And you know what? You and I are among those messengers. And you and I need to therefore be ready to connect the spiritual dots for people when God allows them to cross our paths. And the way that works is by our connecting people with what the Word of God says. Joseph had no Bible. We, on the other hand, have the answers that our world is so desperately thirsty for. And so we need to, as Paul says in 2 Timothy 4, preach the Word. 
Be ready in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and teaching. Do that for someone that God allows to cross your path today. Amen and amen. Today's episode of Bread of His Presence is brought to you by Renton Park Chapel, a church that is committed to the ministry of sharing the joy of hearing and doing God's Word and to the mission of bringing people into the life-giving presence of Jesus Christ in and through vibrant preaching, teaching, Bible study, prayer, and ministry to a world that is in desperate need of the healing touch of Jesus Christ. If you'd like to learn more about our ministry here at Renton Park Chapel or would like to subscribe to the Bread of His Presence podcast, you can visit us online at rentonparkchapel.org or breadofhispresence.org. You can also find us on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, and Instagram. We look forward to hearing from you. Thank you for listening. And may you know all the fullness of having in your life the bread of the presence of God.